and this is an opportunity for you to ask any questions that you have. How we will proceed is that we have an expert with us. I'll introduce him in a moment. He's going to present a few slides for background information. We're going to have a little bit of an engagement by two uh, professors in health and nutrition sciences here at Brooklyn College. And then we're just going to open it up for questions. Um, what we'd like to do is to record just the first part, just the presentation by Dr. Ratson. Uh, so that we can keep that and use that to present to others who weren't able to make it today. We're not going to record anybody's questions or comments. Everything you say here is going to be private to this meeting and uh, is not going to be part of that recording. So if you see the recording on, you should know that that's just because we want the formal presentation by Dr. Ratson to be recorded. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. We are so pleased today to have Dr. Scott C. Ratson with us. He's a distinguished lecturer in the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. He's also the editor-in-chief of a journal called the Journal of Health Communications, International Perspectives. And if ever there were a time where we needed international perspectives and excellent communication on health, now is that time. We are so pleased to have him with us and he's gonna present some slides and then I'll introduce two faculty members who will ask a question or make a comment on the presentation. Dr. Ratson, thank you for coming and uh, we really wanna welcome you to Brooklyn College. Well, um, thank you, President Anderson. It's really a, a pleasure to be here today, unfortunately, via Zoom. Uh, I would have liked to visit the campus. I'd like to first say that my mother graduated Brooklyn College in Yay! 1957. So uh, there, is, there is a strong link. But even, even more importantly, I really commend you and your faculty for hosting this meeting today and addressing this most challenging issue of our times. So I'm going to put some slides on to give some background, about 15 or so. Some will be a little bit more academic just to how we say what your appetite of some of the work that we do at CUNY School of, of uh, Health, Public Health and Health Policy. And uh, the program I lead is actually called um, Health Communication for Social Change. And uh, it's a new graduate program and it's probably as, as uh, you've said for President Anderson, uh, a timely more than ever. So uh, I'm gonna go through these slides. Uh, you see, we actually have something that we call Convince at CUNY, and that actually stands for COVID New Vaccine Information Communication and Engagement. And I'll end to show the kind of research of what we're doing. So I'm gonna, if it's okay, I will share a full screen that might have an opportunity. Oh, that's not working well enough. I'm gonna have to, to show it on uh, a different way like I had. And um, this uh, essentially will go through uh, these 15 slides, if I get it right the fun with Zoom. So uh, what will we like to do? We've, we, uh, in, in public health, what we have come up with is what health is all about. And it's what we as a society do to ensure conditions with that everyone could be healthy. So it's not specifically science. It's not solely uh, based upon politics, but it's the whole mix. And what we've found more than ever is, is that knowing the accurate information is most important at this time more than ever. And as we know, whether we want to call it fake news or some of the political discourse that's been out there, we've had a lot of challenges with COVID. And the most important thing I think is what's happened with COVID is as you can see here, uh, there was a lot of fiction, whether there are movies of call contagion, outbreak, other ones that we knew, COVID hit and all of a sudden we have a whole new world. And this whole new world, if we think about where we were one year ago today, New York, we were, we were in the hundreds of deaths. One week ago was our worst week with 5,319 people who died one week ago a year ago. So uh, this continues to be a huge challenge for us. And uh, the numbers you know, to date are still 50,000 deaths in New York State. But we have a promise and was, this discussion is all about the promise of vaccines. And um, Tony Fauci called this a showstopper a year ago. Uh, it's still a showstopper, but the show isn't stopped because vaccines are only one part of it. Vaccination is what we need to do. And that's what this discussion will be about. And one important part more than ever from our federal government is safety. Safety is probably the most important piece of when a vaccine gets approved, that safety is of utmost importance. 
Uh, and the US FDA has a whole system in place uh, of exactly how we do that. And I'll mention that a little, a little bit later. And as you may know, there are three vaccines currently for emergency use authorization, which is a specific type of approval uh, by Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and J&J. &J. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it was to get us there. And this is what has been done. Uh, we call them clinical trials. You know, a large percent of uh, representative of the population that you will eventually vaccinate in this case. And it goes through a trial from going from uh, healthy volunteers to uh, other participants that are followed through a whole uh, phase three. And this generally takes years in some cases, uh, but for vaccines, we were able to move this up quickly and have safe and effectiveness. And you've heard this enough, this is not about regulatory parts, but to remind that this FDA approval that we had uh, did happen with both safety, with effectiveness and peer review, which is external people uh, who are not involved with the studies who have reviewed this with both scientific and um, public health uh, uh, approaches. And they've inspected everything from the manufacturing all the way up to the approval. And we're continuing with that monitoring process. And let me just say that uh, this vaccine has had millions of people already that have already taken it. And we can talk a little bit more about what happens after the approval. They call it monitoring or phase four, which are studies where we actually see, okay, people got the vaccine. Is there anything that happens thereafter that would be a safety signal or concern? The FDA is the principal regulatory agency. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also has an advisory committee on immunization practice that they collect and analyze information and look at this. And then finally, the advantages of being vaccinated, I think, are, are quite clear. And we've already started to see that. Hopefully, you know of people as one in three uh, Americans are now fully vaccinated and hopefully more have, as we continue this discussion. Four million people today, I believe, are, are online for vaccination. These are the three vaccines. You probably have heard this at um, huge uh, uh, discussions each day. Uh, there are three vaccines. The Pfizer one uh, is 35 days apart from the first to the second dose. Moderna is two with 42 days. And then the J&J &J vaccine, which is fairly recent with 14 days. Uh, although the effectiveness varies, all of these vaccines are effective. And the message that I will say at the end, and I will continue to say, is any vaccine should be taken by people once you are eligible. Uh, these are the side effects, and there's a difference between both side effects and the type of vaccine. They work a little differently. Again, this is not meant to be uh, a scientific or medical presentation, but just to remind that these vaccines that we've been able to, to get are new and the first type of MNRA, which is a messenger uh, vaccine that's been able to really uh, begin in a speedy way to get the, uh, the response that's necessary. And the other time with more of an adenovirus vaccine has been used, the J&J &J, uh, and other ones that are approved around the world, uh, which are slightly different. But the take home message again is safety and effectiveness. All of these three vaccines have a few things in common that are probably most important. Most important, if I really highlight it, is it protects from future infection. They all went through the trials with, with thousands of volunteers. None of them have the live virus. So it's not as if, oh, I've got the vaccine that makes me sick, that gives me COVID. And thirdly, they're any of a term that's used called herd immunity, which means if 80% or so of the population is protected with either vaccination or having immunogenicity to uh, this COVID-19 virus, they will in fact be able to protect all of society in that way. So our goal is to get to this 80%. And, and this is our big challenge that we've been focusing on with our research at CUNY School of Public Health. The other part is that there are side effects. And if I didn't show them, that would mean we're, we're not being fully open. We need to always be able to talk about the pros and the cons, the advantages and the disadvantages. And side effects are, are small in this regard. Uh, I hope many of us remember that we got a full set of childhood vaccines, uh, hopefully through adolescence with HPV and others. Your arm will get sore red, uh, even on an annual flu vaccine for those of us who've been getting those. But these are good signs. Uh, they mean that the vaccine is actually working. They go away. And there's a V-Safe program, which is a vaccine safety 
uh, adverse events initiative where uh, you can sign up for, uh, and generally the sites give this on the CDC site, and you can also get check-ins and find out what's out there. There's a lot of other information that's available at all different levels at state and, um, and local and health system levels. So as I pivot from the actual vaccines, just to mention that what we've been doing is in beginning of March last year, when we saw this epidemic really beginning in New York and thought what was happening in different parts of the world could in fact tear through the city and if not the, the US and, and subsequently the world, we began a public opinion survey. And our public opinion survey gave us snapshots of what people were worried about. And even before the city knew how many you know, people were sick at home who weren't registered, we had at least an idea from the New Yorkers that we were uh, surveying that they knew of somebody who was sick and they were unable to get a test or they didn't really know what to do. So we hope to, to use this and inform not only the media, but also others. And this week we have a, a large survey done in New York, and um, we're doing one in four other med major metropolitan areas to really show the difference with both urban uh, challenges as well as the dis different populations. There is no one side fits all in terms of the communication. So what we have found, and I only have a couple more slides and then we'll have some time to really talk, is that many people don't like vaccines, but they're very, very small when you look at this as a percentage. So most of the population in the United States has had full vaccinations as, as a child and does get a vaccine when it's recommended by a physician. But about 5% that we found continue to have strong anti-vaccine sentiment. And some are always gonna bring up safety issues. And these are just some qualitative pieces that, that were illustrative. People wanted to see how safe it is. We call these the wait and see population, but we're not sure what are they waiting for? How long do they have to see? Some just are outright refusal. I don't like vaccines and they, the whole variety of pieces that go under that. Uh, distrust in the system, which is real. Uh, there's been distrust, particularly in African-American communities for, for, right, for all the right reasons. Uh, but then it also ties in oftentimes to, to the government. These were done during the last administration. Our trust numbers have gone up with the current administration in Washington, uh, but that doesn't mean that there weren't differences between the city and state level. And then finally, the area that we've chose to really focus on is vaccine literacy. Uh, many people don't know what a vaccine does and they don't think that the vaccine uh, is an issue because they don't think that COVID is an issue. So there are these kind of pieces that we've been uh, trying to overcome. So the last three slides will show just what I think our message could be today. Uh, one, uh, we all wanna to return to normal and we want our economy and our schools to open. We wanna protect our families and friends. And we have found the families and friends resonates with the younger population, and I'll say younger, shall we say under 50, versus an older population. It also is at more at risk to the virus where they wanna protect themselves and then family and friends. So we have to you know, even nuance that, but we all want to protect our family and friends. Secondly, our finest medical researchers have warned if we fail, there'll be worse consequences for our families and our economy and potentially ourselves. But we're re realizing the economy is important also for our mental health. Third, the personal responsibility to spread it with ourselves, our families and society. And then finally, an effective science-based approach that's uh, necessary. And that's the wearing face masks, social distancing and getting vaccinated. Three simple tasks all can be done on a uh, uh, basis locally and in communities. And then my last two slides will just show, if you're interested in this, I do, as President Anderson mentioned, been editing the Journal of Health Communication. We had a special issue that's out um, this month. These are just four illustrative articles, but um, the uh, people, for example, uh, Woko and, and um, Bob Hornick or at Annenberg School at Penn have been looking at vaccination and tests and intentions upon black Americans, how we build trust, uh, our folks uh, at, at CUNY have uh, come up with a bibliography on vaccine literacy, and that's a living document to share. Uh, we did this global survey with both our Dean, Ayman al Mahandes and other researchers on age, gender, and education on acceptance of a vaccine. We have that in, in 19 countries, as well as the United States and others. We've got some very interesting information that's been informing hopefully good public prudent policy. I can say that. And then finally, the de decline in trust. This is a group out of Johns Hopkins just looking at who are the institutions, whether it's the government 
but also who are the people, if they're physicians, if they're educators, all of these people are important of how we build trust, which is the overwhelming way we're gonna get out of this. The last slide shows that we've created this vaccine literacy piece. I've been fortunate to, to work with some great colleagues and actually um, they were both graduate students and now uh, graduates who've put together this vaccine literacy bibliography. Uh, we're working very hard to build vaccine literacy and have some work with the Department of Health and, and Mental Health in the city, uh, a national study, as well as, as internationally, uh, we've been uh, putting this new frame, which I think will hopefully will, will fit well. And in the end, build trust, uh, both in our institutions and hopefully build back a, um, a new normal that will be a normal where COVID will be around and we're just gonna have to figure out how to address it. And my very final slide is to show that there's always a team behind us. Uh, the people on the left are our CUNY affiliates. I'm proud to be working with them as well as Heidi Larson, who's really the, the world's expert, who's an anthropologist uh, on vaccine confidence. And then our advisory group on the right. And fortunately um, I've heard uh, Professor Fielding and uh, with both Professor Fielding and Helene Gale, we did a talk similar to this at um, UCLA. Uh, we have others uh, in different parts of the United States and world who are behind us. So um, I will stop here now. Uh, I'll turn it over. I know you have some great faculty, President Anderson, to, to speak. And um, I'll look forward to having the opportunity for other questions and, and move forward.